I'm Amanda Fancy. I'm the dealer owner of Gals Home Hardware and Furniture. We've been at this location for about a year. We started in 1848, uh, way back when. Um, this is our fifth location, so um, you know we've we've never uh, have left the town limits. So when we're looking to build this location. You know we had lots of opportunity to potentially look at um, you know outside of the town limits, uh, but it was really key for us to be um, and continue to be um, a growing business in Bridgewater. Bridgewater, Nova Scotia is unique. We have a beautiful countryside. Our, our town is 7,500 people, but then, you know, our customer reach is about 45,000. So, you know, we're talking about lots of small communities, um, you know, hidden treasures. There's huge opportunity here, and I think that it's certainly worthwhile to, uh, to make the visit, uh, make the call, do some inquiring, because it certainly is uh, somewhere where I think there would be some uh, you know, strong investment opportunities for sure. My name is Joey Richard. I come from Quebec, Montreal. Um, I've studied opera at the Montreal Conservatory of Music, so this is where I've learned about Italian, the language, and the food. And my passion just became bigger and bigger for food. I've been cooking for 20 years, almost. I opened a family business, but the only thing I forgot is that my family is still in Montreal so I'm like you know I'm trying I make new friends I, I I'm building this thing but it is a family business here my chef is like my brother his wife is like my sister so I mean I, I recreated a family uh, environment we do the real recipes starting from the real ingredients and for Italian food what the secret is few ingredients and very fresh so each recipe would be like three four ingredients maximum but i mean it's just the best ingredients and makes it so delicious if you think that it's impossible to have your own business i'm the living proof that it is possible people want us to thrive we work together so it, everybody helps each other if you want to be part of a community it is the community to be My name is Joel Holland. I'm the owner and operator of Manitou Athletics. I found the opportunity, started this gym in my parents' garage, and now we are currently in an 8,600 square foot facility. A lot of people come here because of the community. The, the things that we offer here are different than a normal gym. It's an open atmosphere where you come in, the music's played over the loudspeakers, not in your ears. You don't put earbuds in and uh, just walk around from one machine to the other. You, uh, you focus on yourself, but at the same time you get to meet new people. We have three floors, uh, which we do CrossFit, uh, boot camps, athletic training, and personal training. We have so many other businesses. Good evening everyone. I'll call this regularly scheduled meeting of Bridgewater Town Council to order. And um, just uh, as always note that the town of Bridgewater is located in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And it is indeed a privilege for us to be here. Uh, are there, well, there are additions to the agenda. Um, <laughs> so I know I got a list from uh, Sandra. So we're adding document 22-191, uh, pre-budget approval and project acceleration for separate storm sewer for St. Philip Street and business park expansion delineation of contaminated soil area under reports and recommendations. Are there any other additions? Oh, and deletions, we're deleting minutes because the minutes are not attached, so we will, the next meeting, we'll have the October minutes. Any other additions or 
amendments to the agenda. Hearing none, I have a motion to approve the agenda as circulated, as amended, sorry. Councillor Thorburn, seconded by Councillor Caldwell. All those in favor? As opposed, motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, announcements from members of council. I'll, I'll start by just thanking everyone who worked hard to put on the uh, Remembrance Day ceremony, as always. Um, great to see. I was out of town, but watched online and uh, grateful that we have a have that live streamed. I saw lots of comments from people who um, aren't even in our region watching it, so that was nice. And thank you to Deputy Mayor Fujir for representing the town and depositing the wreath. Are there any other announcements from members of council? Councilor Thorburn? Just, just to touch on that uh, Remembrance Day, it was an awesome day for weather-wise. I think it was probably a record-setting day. Uh, a huge crowd there and lots of young people from what we like to see at the branch. There's a lot there marching and walking and talking the service, but I guess the highlights of November 11th service was certainly the Pentons in Time by Terry Kelly, the band done an awesome job, and, and certainly the Highland Dancing by A.B. Smel Smeltzer. The crowd loved it, and uh, we shared that on our web page and Facebook, and so we had thousands of hits, people watching it. As a matter of fact, I've watched it three or four times. And uh, when it was actually taking place, I had a little tear in my eye because every time I listen to it, it, it's just that feeling that comes over you and how much it means to you as a Legion member and as a veteran and certainly as a citizen. So it was quite emotional, but it was a, a quite a great day and I was certainly proud to escort Cheryl, Deputy Mayor. Mm -hmm. The only disappointment of the day, and, and it's happened now a couple of years, was, was a fly pass. We put a lot of effort in that, a lot of letters sent out and a lot of preparation and that morning we got a call that they couldn't make it. And we don't know they can't make it until that day, so that was disappointing for, for us uh, as Legion members and certainly for the public, but it was an awesome day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Deputy Mayor for sure. Yes, <laughs> I'll just, uh, a reminder that uh, the Christmas on the Hague Committee is busy planning for uh, the event, uh, which is Saturday, November 26th. Uh, the parade starts at 6, so there's still time to put in your Parade application, you can go to our website, uh, bridgewater, um, back, bridgewater .ca backslash parade, I believe. Um, so please get your applications in. Uh, there'll be <coughs> fireworks um, as well. So um, hope to uh, have everybody out for that special event. Great, I know everyone's looking forward to that. So that's exciting. Other announcements? Um, I'd just like to note that this is Transgender Awareness Week and the uh, transgender flag is flying at Shipyard's Landing for this week. Um, we want to be a safe and inclusive community for everyone. Um, that, When we say everyone, that means without exception. And so um, it is important to, to recognize um, all people. And so the, again, this week is Transgender Awareness Week. Councillor Thorburn. Very important thing I've forgotten, and certainly apologize to Lynette down at the museum and the knitters that made that beautiful oh my gosh. banner. Uh, mm. It was awesome. Uh, I'm going to take it down uh, tomorrow, and it's going to hang down in the gallery there for to the end of the month. We didn't want to leave it outside in town for weather. And uh, the challenge is out there now, we're going to see other people knitting, so maybe next year we can do a second section, and the next year the other section. And at some point in time, we'll go there, but I thought and that internet should be acknowledged for what they've done. Absolutely. To make it important. Yeah. Thank well, you. Thank you for doing that. All right. Um, I don't see any delegations here. Uh, so we're going to go down to planning items and planning analysis report, development agreement application for 388 <coughs> King Street. <coughs> tonight so I'm going to be saying next a lot so just a heads up. Uh, so staff received an application um, by Black Bay Real Estate Group for a development agreement to construct a mixed-use development containing 71 residential units and ground floor commercial at 388 King Street. This property is located on King Street on the Riverside uh, between Dufferin Street and Maple Street um, and it's shown outlined in red. The property is uh, 22,520 square feet, or about half an acre, and it's currently vacant except for an accessory unit. It's zoned as Historic Downtown Commercial, or C1, uh, in the land use bylaw. And the surrounding zoning is uh, more Historic Downtown Commercial, which is all shown in pink, 
uh, downtown residential park, and there's a single or there's single unit residential and institutional nearby as well. The property is designated as downtown commercial in future land use map of the, plan, the municipal planning strategy. And the surrounding uses include single unit dwellings, multi unit dwellings, offices, personal service shops, and retail. Uh, so, just for some context of the current site, um, this is what can be seen from street level. So, you'll see the um, town's pump station is the small brick building um, closer to the left, um, and the property starts right after that and goes uh, past where the, uh, the gray building and that. Uh, that motorhome are. So the application is to construct a mixed-use residential and commercial development. Commercial use would make up about half of the ground floor and there would be 71 residential units in total, uh, the most, of, most of them being on the upper stories. The building would be seven stories uh, but it resembles a six-story building from King Street and seven stories from the river due to the grade of the site. Uh, the plan is to have the majority of the units be one and two bedroom uh, plus a few three bedroom units as well. This is the proposed site plan of the property. Uh, the building would front onto King Street, um, which you can see at the bottom of the picture, and it would be set back on an angle to follow the property line behind the adjacent buildings that you can see as kind of white squares to the right. The driveway would be located on the north side of the building and would lead to underground parking. This is the ground floor plan showing the commercial units as well as some of the residential units. Um, there would be two commercial units, smaller one at the front and a larger one with access from the front as well as the rear of the building. Uh, and with this larger unit, there would be a wraparound commercial patio that you can see. The entrances to both of the commercial spaces as well as the main residential entrance would be at the front uh, near the north side of the building. And there would also be three townhouse style units with individual entrances on the front and uh, there would be stairs and an accessible ramp to access all of the front entrances. In front of the building, there would be a public plaza and that would be on the town's property uh, in front of the stairs and ramp that are shown there. So this is a view of the building from the northern corner on King Street, similar to the context photo that I'd shown earlier. The small white building is the town's pump station. Uh, you can see some of the commercial patio that would wrap around to the side. It wouldn't be accessible from the front because right where that ends is where the, uh, the garage door is to the underground parking. You can see large windows and doors for the commercial spaces along the front and side of the building. The townhouse style units can be seen here as well, um, so just further to the right of the image. Um, there would be step backs at various levels of the building. So for the front of the building, uh, I was going to use a clicker for this, so bear with me. Just above the townhouses, there's a slight step back, as well as another one a few floors up from that. There's a small step back at the um, top of the small commercial unit at the front, and then um, three stories up from that as well, there's another step back, and then another one. Oh, don't worry about it. Oh, you can still point at it. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to highlight, yeah, a few of those. So there's step backs there, step backs there and then there's a few different ones on this section of the building at the front, and that's just to reduce the massing on the street. So this is a view from the building for uh, the north side uh, near the river. You can see the continuation of that interior and exterior commercial use along the side and rear, and there would be a floating dock to create public access to the river as well. The dock could be accessed from the commercial patio, uh, the residential stairwell, or from the sidewalk along the northwest side of the building that you can see here and this sidewalk would be uh, required to be well lit. And as for step backs at the base, uh, there would be one at the base of the sixth story on the riverfront. So this shows the <coughs> building from the south side on King Street, um, heading down towards the downtown. Um, and I just included this so you can see on um, the small plaza in the distance that would be in front on the town's property. Um, and uh, just showing the existing buildings that are on King Street, shown in white, they're one and two stories. So you can just see um, how the building tucks around those. Uh, this is a view from the southern side of the river, and you can see here a mix of the materials that the applicant is proposing to use for the facade. Um, there would be um, some fiber cement cladding, a brick pattern on the bottom four stories, um, a darker charcoal cover, color above, and white or a light color on the top story as well. And at the south side of the building, there would be a step back at the base of the sixth story here, and then one just above it as well. And I wanted to touch on the grade of the site a bit um, in terms of the, um, the height and the scale within the area. Uh, so this image, uh, the yellow, is contour lines, and they are one meter contour lines, but I'll just um, speak in feet. So um, as mentioned, it would be seven stories from the river and six stories from King Street, and that is because of this topography. So there's about a 13 foot elevation change going up from the river um, all the way up to King Street. 
And there's also about a 16 foot elevation change across the side of the property too. Um, so that's something that the architects uh, dealt with through design. Um, and that was also incorporated um, for flood mitigation. So in order to be deemed suitable for mitigating flooding, uh, the floor of the basement had to be a certain height, which I'll talk about after. Uh, the architects were able to design the building so the smaller commercial unit on the front here would still be at ground level, um, while that rear commercial space would be accessed by um, stairs as well as a ramp that goes around here. So it's all accessible or barrier free. And this elevation drawing shows the front of the buildings, um, the, sorry, the front of the building here on the left on King Street, and this is the Riverside. So the overall building height along King Street is approximately 62 feet. You can see with the inclusion of the step backs that I've been talking about, that the building goes back from King Street at those various heights. So the step back at the top of the second story that's above those townhouse units is about uh, 23 feet high, while the step back at the top of the fourth story along the front of the building here um, is approximately 43 feet in height. And the overall building height from the riverside is approximately 74 feet from the bottom of the basement parking level. A traffic impact study was received and reviewed by the town's engineering department. It found that the nearby intersection of King Street and Dufferin Street is operating at an overall acceptable level, um, and there is vehicular capacity <coughs> on King Street. There's only a sidewalk on the opposite side of the street um, in front of this property, but there is a signalized crosswalk, and the applicant has proposed extending the crosswalk, or sorry, extending the sidewalk in front of the building. There are also appropriate sight lines from the proposed driveway location. So as for parking, the land use bylaw requires a minimum of 36 vehicular parking spaces, and they're proposing uh, just under that at 35 spaces, which would include four accessible spaces. And these would be located underground, uh, but because this development is through a development agreement, the land use bylaw is used as a guideline and doesn't have to be strictly adhered to. The land use bylaw requires 36 bicycle parking spaces, and they are proposing 41, and these would also be located in the underground parking. So uh, the property is located in the La Haye River Development Agreement area, so a flood mitigation report was required. And when determining the mitigative solutions, uh, the applicant used the worst case scenario from the town's 2013 flood risk mapping. And they're proposing that the basement floor level would be above the calculated flood level. Um, it would be at 5.65 meters, um, and the flood level is 5.5 meters. And um, the engineering, no, engineering depart, department sorry, noted that if the existing retaining wall is to be used, it would need to be assessed by a professional engineer. However, the applicant plans to add a retaining wall at the rear of the property and along the north side of the building, which is beside the driveway and the sidewalk that they're proposing to head down towards the river. So based on the unit breakdown of the development, uh, just under 14,000 square feet of amenity space is required by the land use bylaw, and the applicant is proposing just under 13,000 square feet. Uh, this would be composed of balconies, patios, terraces, a common room and gym, a public deck, and a rooftop patio. The applicant is also proposing a public floating dock and a public plaza out front, uh, but because those would be located outside of the property boundaries, they technically don't fit into the definition of amenity space, but they are important spaces for the public and the residents and contribute to the development. So uh, just to give a brief overview of what the drafted development agreement would include, it would outline a maximum of 71 dwelling units, including three townhouse style units that would have individual main entrances located on the front of the building, as well as a minimum amount and precise location of ground floor commercial area. For parking and access, the development agreement would outline the location of the driveway and sidewalk, the requirement to construct a public sidewalk on the town's property at the front of the building, the requirement for the barrier free access to the commercial entrances and main residential entrance, and the minimum amount of vehicular and bicycle parking spaces uh, that would be required. It states that the height and massing shall be in substantive accordance with the elevation drawings um, that would be attached to the development agreement, and that the material and color of cladding shall be in reasonable accordance with the elevation drawings. It also outlines requirements for those setbacks that I've talked about, uh, primary entrances, as well as window coverage and placement on the building. It contains the minimum amount of amenity space that would be required and what it shall be composed of. It also states that a landscaping plan shall be submitted prior to receiving a development permit. There would also be requirements for the inclusion of the rear public deck, the exterior commercial deck, floating dock, and public plaza at the front. Lighting would have to be su sufficient enough to provide safety and security, specifically for the sidewalk that heads down towards the river. There would also be clauses about maintenance, solid waste, servicing, and stormwater management. Uh, the development agreement would also state that flooding mitigative measures would be required as outlined in the flood mitigation plan that was provided, and also that an erosion control design report would be required um, prior to permitting. 
and the substan substantive matters of this DA would be the permitted use um, as well as the height, massing, and step backs um, as per the development agreement schedules. Uh, so a public participation meeting was held on January 19th and 13 members of the public attended and the following is the main points of conversation. Um, so they spoke about the historic, maintaining the historical uh, integrity of the area, um, and that they didn't necessarily believe this building did that. Um, a lack of parking, concern over height and scale of the building and the effect on the current views of the river. Um, there was also though, support for the height, scale and design of the building, as well as support for increasing access to the river. Uh, people mentioned that the development could contribute to uh, growth of the downtown. There were concerns or questions about the sewer infrastructure, um, concerns about the increased traffic flow that would come from the building, um, and just questions about um, the instability of the property as well as the wharves that are underneath. Um, so to just touch on policy, staff completed a policy analysis which can be found in the report. And uh, the current zoning, the C1 zoning, is the central commercial and cultural district of town with retail, professional and service related businesses plus complementary residential. And for this area, the municipal planning strategy encourages a walkable urban character, boutique style shops, leisure and recreation activity and access to the river, which this development focuses on. In uh, general, for general policy, um, there were statements that staff looked at, including minimizing the conflict between land uses, considering compatibility with adjacent property, supporting a full range of housing options and styles, requiring amenity space, promoting residential densification, uh, and specifically in the downtown core, encouraging context sensitive residential infill, and encouraging compact urban form and adaptive reuse. There are also some policies that are specific to multi-unit buildings in the C1 zone. And these are to encourage attractive commercial development, regulate design and appearance of commercial development, um, have a minimum of uh, buildings that are, sorry, buildings that are minimum of two stories high, uh, giving con strong consideration to the urban design requirements and requiring an architecturally distinct base and top of the building. There are policies specific to the developments in the La Have River Development Agreement area, and these include that, um, include that flooding and erosion risks are reasonably, reasonably mitigated, that no development um, shall happen where flooding presents a risk um, or hazard to people and property, and general consistency with the downtown and waterfront master plan is required. Um, also, it looks to integrate uh, the building with the existing streetscape as well as the riverside, which would be done um, through things like windows and balconies, um, and also promoting access to the river. Um, and finally, um, for our infrastructure related policy, um, it looks at requiring parking, ensuring stormwater flows are not higher than current peak flows, requiring adequate infrastructure for development, um, looking at site access and emergency service response, considering adequacy of active transportation and considering environmental impacts. So for this development, um, staff recommend that council give first consideration to the development agreement and schedule a public hearing uh, during the regular meeting of council on December 12th. Wonderful, thank you. That was a lot to go through. Um, <laughs> are there any questions from members of council? On this one, <laughs> Councillor Tanner first. Thank you, uh, Mackenzie. It was hard to get a uh, an understanding of the back view mm -hmm. of that property facing the river, mm -hmm. and, but from the images that I've seen and, and a, a little note about future riverside floating dock, I have a bit of a fear that while the upper half or three quarters looks great, mm -hmm. that bottom lower section might look like the back of the mall in essence. That same sort of concept. And do you have any commentary on that? And, yeah. and is it possible to make the floating dock piece a requirement? Yes, so okay. it would be a requirement seasonally. Okay. I didn't mention that. Okay, so um, I can't remember specifically how we wrote it in the <coughs> development agreement, but it would be for a certain amount of months during the year. Um, and yeah, that's tricky. Um, unfortunately, there has to be things like the retaining wall and um, just the raised level of the um, parking level or the basement level because of flood mitigation. Right. So originally they were looking at something looked similar on the back, but it was the lower, um, okay. the basement was lower, but unfortunately just based on our policy and um, the study they did, they have to bump that up. So they're attempting to use the space a little bit. There's like a little bit of a residential amenity space on one side, the floating dock, and then access to those commercial patios, uh, their commercial patio on the back. So given your planning experience, are there ways to pretty that up even more, so to speak? It's hard at this point because we don't have like the detailed design of what that will okay. look like. Um, I would say... So be patient and wait for that. <laughs> be patient, but then that's also hard too. I guess there's okay. there's the ability through maybe art or something, but I don't know how visible that would be um, when the building is like tucked back a little bit and there's that overhanging right. commercial area. Um, so there's been talks about like lighting and including that floating dock and stuff, but that's, okay. that's where we got to with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you. Could do like a living wall or something there, maybe. Oh, interesting. 
uh, Councillor Colwell. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I will say I'm excited about this project. Uh, that said, uh, we recently received the downtown parking study, which identified this development is potentially causing some issues with uh, lack of parking in that area. Because this is a development agreement, I think we have uh, an opportunity to help uh, address that up front rather than, uh, you know, years down the road when it does become a problem and then the town has to come up with a solution to fix it. So I'd like to see that um, somehow identified up front. Um, and my other question was um, the flood risk uh, mitigation. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was nine years old. Do we have any concern that that may be out of date or um, are confident that's fine? There, I, w I would say um, that it would probably be accurate still. Um, staff is looking into continuing that work to get some updated information, but unfortunately we don't have that at the time. So this is what is in the town's municipal planning strategy um, to base it off of. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just quickly touch on the parking as well. Um, so it's a tricky situation because they are so close to the water um, that they wouldn't be able to build down anymore. Um, so they have the one level of parking. If they added another level of parking, it would be above King Street grade, which is not something that the land use bylaw or the municipal planning strategy would recommend um, because we want to have that commercial um, or residential face. Um, the applicant is looking at uh, retaining parking elsewhere nearby, but it isn't specifically put in the development agreement. We could require it though could we not? I think or? we could yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I can look into that and see what that wording might be like I don't know if it would be a number of spaces or if it would be a little bit more generic but that's something that we can look into other comments or questions Councilor Thorburn it's a big building I hope our ladder truck can reach it I don't think you can get down behind it uh, but I'm assuming that that and maybe I shouldn't assume that that building the sprinkler system? I believe it, they, I haven't spoken about that, but I believe all buildings at that level um, would be. be. Yeah. I think by, by the fire code, they have to be. Exactly, yeah. and the development agreement stipulates that there needs to be enough um, water pressure as well right. for fire, um, so that's something that would be looked at for the um, through the building code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And certainly one or two elevators in there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Any other comments? I just, I'll just say, I'm I too excited about this one. Um, the parking one is, um, yeah, like like the other developments. It's you want to spur on development, you want to spur on uh, active transportation and getting people on the bus, but you also want to make sure that you're not moving cars, shuffling cars around um, to other areas of the community. Um, it was interesting to do a little digging. A few people have said you should be more like Halifax. Well, if we were more like Halifax, there would be zero requirements for parking in their downtown. For a building like this, like zero, <laughs> and I, I am not in support of zero. Um, but to to Councillor Caldwell's point, like knowing that they're probably going to need a little bit more, it would be there is a parking lot across the street, so it would be nice to know if, if they've engaged the the um, owner. But I also I'll use the same argument I used with the other one. If I had two cars and wasn't guaranteed a parking space in this building, I would simply look for another place to live. And I think that's, if they're building a business case based on half spaces, then and they think they can fill the building, um, I guess, <laughs> fill your boots. <laughs> um, I was going to ask a question, though. When we, and this might kind of go down the road of addressing your question. So when we have a, a large um, subdivision that's being planned. We require X number of either dollars or land for green space. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm wondering if, as we go down the road of parking, if there's perhaps using something similar to say, if you're, if you are not providing a certain percentage of, uh, and maybe this ends up being that percentage, but if you're not providing uh, what council deems at the time of adequate parking, then a cash in lieu, mm -hmm because if we have to build a parking lot, if we have to put a second level on something, then it's not the taxpayer putting the whole bill. You can, you need policy support right. for that. Yeah. So and just we as we, I know we're we going through, going to go have it. Um, yeah. yeah, so we already have it in our um, uh, land use bylaw, um, but it is like up to this limit. Um, so that's something to explore, I guess, if it was something that council wanted to see more of. I don't know how we would look into that, but there is the ability to do it, yeah. Okay, Councilor Thorburn. According to our policy, we're talking about one parking space. Correct, yeah. Just to be clear, no more, 
No. <coughs> Oh yeah, like like to me, it's it's there's there's this one, I, I, and if we want more spaces in the future, we can't. I don't think we can reasonably penalize this developer because he's meeting the mm -hmm. or almost meeting the right. our criteria, mm -hmm. right? So we'd have to change the bylaws and the policies to allow that to happen. Right mm -hmm. now, they're compliant minus one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you can actually exceed the land use bylaw requirements if council chose yeah. to. Because yeah. uh, it's a yeah. development agreement, just like you could go less than what the land just got. No, but, but to counter the Roman's point, it's like if you added one change. space, we can't say you need 50 more spaces because right. they put in the application when we only needed these spaces. You could, because it's a DA. So you, you set aside the land use bylaw requirements. It's a question of whether you want to, right? Yeah. And we would have to look then at, like, <coughs> if, if, if council did require more parking spaces is that in line with our municipal planning strategy or not which I would argue it wouldn't necessarily be because our municipal planning strategy focuses on a variety of transportation and does then set the requirements in the land use bylaw for active transportation transit right. that type mm -hmm. of stuff mm -hmm. yeah. okay any other questions that's good comments mm -hmm. yes um, please oh. just one just for clarity mm -hmm. um, if council's looking for a change in the development agreement, you have to consider whether, like, if you know that now, um, when we do first consideration, you go to public hearing, unless the change is non-substantial, you have to do first consideration and public hearing over again. So uh, it's unclear if council's looking for that change, and if not, then first consideration's fine. If they are, then I think I, you'd have to consider uh, I'm asking if it would be substantial or non-substantial. Yeah. And I guess, uh, yeah, I would like us to give, I, I don't have a specific ask, I would like us to give more careful consideration to the parking issues that were identified in the parking study. I think this is our, this is basically our opportunity to deal with it through the development agreement. Uh, I don't know, I don't have a solution, but I think perhaps that something could be done through the development agreement that um, I don't, I, like I said, I don't have a solution, but perhaps something could be done at this point. Um, once it's, a, you know, once this is all approved, um, then it becomes um, the public's problem, the town's problem to deal with. If the shortage of parking that is forecast comes to be, then we have to deal with it. Um, the public has to pay one way or another. Um, we may be able to address that up front that's that's my uh, that would be my wish I don't know how the council feels um, yeah so to the CAO's point if, if we if we're gonna make a, a request you, you're asking that we have to give direction now that we want to change. It depends on what it is that you want changed yeah. right so if you're if you're looking to say you need to negotiate an off-site parking location and it needs to be an additional I don't know well, 30 parking spaces is that considered substantial or if it's just one or two, it probably wouldn't be. Yeah. But if it were, a, you know, a, a whole different location for parking, then the public might be interested in that, depending on the size of the parking area and stuff like that. Yeah, that's true. I guess it would depend on the requirement. And, mm -hmm. and even if there is no, like, answer to it at this point, it, I don't know how that would work if we could go back and explore the opportunities and then staff would confirm if it ended up being, um, if we'd have to come back for first reading or not based on what we landed on. Yeah, and, and that, that's, uh, if you do first consideration now, knowing that you want some alternatives looked at and brought back, then depending, as you say, depending on what it is, it could prompt us to have to do this part over again in the public hearing over again. So you can, you can wait and cross that bridge when you get, if you get there, or you can defer a decision for alternatives and then do first consideration at the next council meeting. thoughts on that so for so for me it's really we're based on our our land use bylaw we're one we're one mm -hmm. short and um, like I I guess I don't really have a doubt that there's a need well we know there's a need for parking all downtown spread out across the town um, I I personally am uncomfortable I'm just speaking for myself of holding up a development that the developer thought he had to have 35, 35? Mm -hmm. 35 spaces, mm -hmm. he's presenting 34. 
And if we go back and say, well, now we want 55, I guess if I, if I were in that person's shoes, regardless of who the developer is, I'd be saying, well, in your land use bylaw, I should have said 55. And I would have worked on a scale towards 55. Um, there is the possibility that, um, uh, depending on how the conversation goes with the applicant and what um, staff is, is providing us some, some options or that discussion, we might be able to come back for the first reading um, on December 12th, and then the public hearing would be bumped to the new year. Um, but it's always hard to know, I guess, um, how long that discussion mm -hmm. would take or what we would come back with. But that's the question. Councilor Tanner. But in this case, I would ask, like, what is an acceptable additional amount of parking? Like, does anybody know that? It's a great question. <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah. I don't. Study doesn't tell us that, really. Well, I believe the study had a number, could it not? I mean, these are all estimates. But not per development? Or like per a unit? number that we would be short in that area. Uh, it, it had projections based yeah. on that area, which is more than just this mm -hmm. building that would contribute to that mm -hmm. deficit. But it, it did identify that that area there would be a, a, a pinch, yep. maybe short. And that was based on full occupancy for all businesses and It was based on what was on our plate right now in terms of development agreements, so this and what's in place right now. Council McDonald. Could a conversation with the developer, um, knowing that that area is specifically uh, going to be short parking in the future, could a conversation with them hurt to kind of explore are there other options? Do they see a, a, a possibility or a, a potential solution? Um, you know, and then, you know, to some degree, it's uh, and, and you probably had these conversations with them. A responsibility to make sure that they're aware that mm -hmm. this area will be short on parking at some point in the future. If there's a solution now, this is a good time to look at it. Um, it has that conversation already happened, or is it? Or do you see any? It's more is focused it on the the development itself, um, but they have right. kind of from the beginning voiced that they would um, provide parking elsewhere. Um, so on uh, on your question about the impact, I would say the impact would just be the timeline. Um, I would say. A, a conversation could be had, but then it would just require us to come back again. Um, if, depending on the amount we alter the development agreement, um, it from first reading to public hearing, if it was like Tammy said, something that was not actually substantial, um, then we would be able to go to public hearing. So that'd be the main impact having that conversation. That's stubborn. Yeah, I'm in the mayor's camp on this one because we've got policy which dictates what we can and can't do and to go contrary to that defeats the whole purpose of having policy. So, you know, if we want to change policy or do what we can to increase the parking, then the policy should be looked at so that when developers come here, they know up front. We're not going after the fact. We're inquiring something that wasn't required when they made their application. That's where I'm at on this one, and I find it very hard to vote otherwise, personally. It's also kind of a chicken and the egg, right? Because the, the parking study shows when everything's done, right? So there's, there are some ifs if everything gets done. To me, the, the developer is going to go across the street to the parking lot. That's a natural. So. Um, it could be us that needs to look for new parking. Well, we, we have a lease agreement for that those right. spaces right now, so they come to us and look for, for permits, permit. or they would right. look to um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It could impact our lease maybe to, with the because it's an annual lease. Yeah. So the yes. Okay. Looking. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Could be coming back to council with council asking council to find more parking. <laughs> yes. That's all. So you're looking for a motion to get this on the floor? Uh, well, yeah. Let's put a motion on the floor, and then if 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 people want to, um, we can debate to pass the motion or deferring or sure. You want to do it, Andrew? Oh, I guess you you were starting, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I have a preference either way. But. 
Uh, I move the council for the town of Bridgewater give first consideration to the, to the development agreement as contained in Appendix A of Document 21179A for the subject properties and schedule a public hearing during the regularly scheduled council meeting on December 12, 2022 at 6 p.m. in council chambers at Town Hall. Okay, do I have a seconder? Councilor Thorburn. Further discussion? Question. So, Councilor, can I just say to uh, Councilor Caldwell, so we didn't have a, so we didn't have a solution for this. Um, maybe this doesn't preclude like staff can reach out to the developer and, and just perhaps express that council is is a little concerned about the parking and and be a little bit perhaps more concrete on the steps that they're taking so if they've mentioned that they're looking at securing some off-site parking perhaps that would help council as we go to second reading yeah and um, I think to, to understand what that looks like yeah, and I think there would be kind of two ways um, if they were looking for off-site parking, if it were included in the development agreement, we'd have to see how that was worded to see if we need to come back for first consideration. Um, or if they didn't want it in the development agreement, they could say, we are still doing this and we kind of we kind of be in this situation again. So there would be different, uh, it might come back in different ways based on that conversation, but we can have it. Yeah, and, I, and one would be enforceable, one wouldn't be. Yeah, yeah, that exactly. would be the difference. So, that would uh, I'd be fine with that that would appease me okay. uh, especially because like I said I am excited about the project but I do have this uh, hang up <laughs> yeah, I uh, no, I understand I think we're all kind of feeling different different degrees of the same yeah. thing okay we have mover seconder any any question was called <laughs> all those in favor those opposed motion is carried thank you that's great discussion Sorry, I, I I love when council. Oops, sorry. <laughs> council just has a, a good, honest back and forth. Back in the NSF family. <laughs> just very grateful to sit around this council table. Uh, okay, moving forward, we're down to 9.1 Community Energy Poverty Survey final report, and I see uh, Mr. Devree coming to the podium, and I know we have a guest on joining us virtually. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Nice to see you again, and welcome to Dr. Milan Riva, who is joining us virtually. Nice to see you as well. I'll just give a very quick introduction and then turn things over to Dr. Riva, who will give most of this presentation. Um, so council may recall that we signed a research agreement with, uh, with Dr. Riva and her student team and her research collaborators to investigate uh, the issue of energy poverty in Bridgewater. This is part of the Energize Bridgewater program, which seeks to reduce the rate of energy poverty in our community by 20% by 2026. Ambitious. And as part of our contribution agreement with the Government of Canada, uh, we are required to evaluate that. And two of the means by which we can do that is to conduct a pre-program uh, community uh, survey and then a post-program uh, survey to assess whether there has been any impact on the, uh, the community's energy poverty rate. And, and Dr. Riva will speak to what does energy poverty mean in our community and what does it look like and what is the lived experience of our residents. So I'm excited to let her speak in a moment. Um, I will just say that um, it's been a wonderful research partnership to work with, uh, with Dr. Riva and her collaborators. And uh, this actually forms part of a proposed multi-year set of studies called BRIDGES, which stands for Bridgewater Energy Security, which Dr. Riva is uh, very actively seeking funds to help the town um, implement as well. We have been a, a co-funder of, uh, of this particular work, um, and it gives me great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Riva speak about it. Dr. Riva is the Canada Research Chair in Housing, Community and Health at the Department of Geography at McGill University. And I may say a, a thing or two at the very end, but I'll turn it over right now to, uh, to Milan. Thank you very, very much, Milan. Can you hear me okay? And should I share my screen with the slides, or do you all have the slides with you? We, uh, we can hear you, but uh, if you could share your screen, that would be great. Okay, all right. Can you now see the slides? Yes, we can. All right, so thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure to, uh, to be invited uh, this evening to present some of the results from 
a survey we conducted in Bridgewater earlier this year. Um, before getting into the results, I just want to acknowledge um, Leon the Great and the whole team at Energize Bridgewater and at the town of Bridgewater, uh, the churches, businesses, and community organizations in Bridgewater that helped us in recruiting participants for the survey. Um, also acknowledge the contribution of people from Bridgewater who took their time to respond to our main questions. Um, and I also want to acknowledge um, my staff at McGill and collaborators in Canada and abroad who helped uh, in designing this study. Well, the survey was conducted in the town of Bridgewater between April 29 and June 15, 2022. So we had a team of four uh, researchers that lived in Bridgewater for uh, over a month. They went door to door to most neighborhoods uh, to distribute postcards about uh, the study. They put up flyers in different venues across town. There were posts on social media uh, to invite people to, uh, to participate and outreach uh, was conducted at various community events. Overall, 516 people from Bridgewater responded to the survey. So in terms of eligibility, uh, we were recruiting uh, one person per household that was age 19 years and older that were residents uh, within the city limits of the town of Bridgewater, and this we assessed that using the six-digit postal code. They had to be either owning or renting their dwelling and having lived at their current address at the time the survey was conducted, at least since January 2022. We asked many questions with the survey to document housing condition, energy use, and cost of energy, <coughs> question around mobility and demographics, and questions on health and well-being. And of course, our main interest was to assess energy poverty, and to do this, we used different indicators. So first set of indicators we use uh, were based on expenditure. So the share of household income going to home energy costs. So we use the 10% threshold. So uh, people in households spending more than 10% of their income on home energy costs were considered uh, as facing energy poverty. And then we also use the threshold uh, of 5.4% which is uh, twice the national median uh, of the ratio of home energy cost to household income. So with this threshold, people spending more than 5.4% of their household income were considered as facing energy poverty. And we also used uh, a range of self-reported measures. So people self-reporting about their ability to afford keeping their dwelling uh, adequately warm in the winter, um, questions about uh, perceived thermal comfort of their dwelling, and experiences of financial hardship. So looking at the two um, expenditure-based measure of energy poverty, starting with uh, the lower bar, we see that about 17% of participants to the survey reported um, or were categorized as energy poor as per the 10% threshold. When we move the threshold to 5.4%, it's more than twice that that are in energy poverty. It's 38% of, of the participants to the survey that were classified as facing energy poverty. Moving on to self-reported indicators of thermal um, discomfort, 20% said that they could not afford to keep their dwelling adequately warm in the past full season. Almost 15% reported an average indoor temperature that is below the World Health Organization guidelines. Um, of 18 degrees Celsius. Over 20% said that their dwelling was so cold in the past 
uh, winter that they shivered in sight. Eight percent said that they could see their breath in sight. And um, about 12 percent reported uh, having had a hard time sleeping in the past cold season because it was so cold inside their dwelling. If we turn to financial hardship, 35% of uh, the people that we met said that they had to juggle bills in the past year to pay their um, energy bills. 32% said they had to cut back on grocery to pay for energy bills. 23% uh, said that they had difficulty paying their utility bills on time. 18% said they had to cut back unpaid for utilities uh, in order to buy food. About 10% received um, notification of disconnection from utilities companies. Uh, just under 10% reported that there were days when the home was not shifted because they could not afford energy bills. Um, and about 4% said that their utilities were disconnected. <coughs> We also ask questions to assess energy poverty as it relates to both um, home energy cost and energy for transportation. Um, about 35% of participants uh, were spending more than 10% of their income on home and transportation energy. About 30%, actually 29% reported um, experiencing difficulty in the previous year affording them their transportation needs. And over 60% said that they avoided making certain trips in the past year to lower the cost of transportation. So to sum up the key indicators of energy poverty in the town of Bridgewater, before the full implementation of energized fridge water, we see that 38% um, of the participants are facing energy poverty um, as uh, when using the 5.4% the uh, of income going to um, energy bills. So households uh, devoted more than uh, 5.4% of their income to pay for energy bills. 20% uh, reported difficulty affording to keep their dwelling adequately warm. And 29% reported difficulty affording their transportation needs. We also assessed energy poverty in relation to various health indicators. And we see that people facing energy poverty are significantly more at risk to report poor self-rated health, poor mental health, to report more stress in daily life, and to report lower life satisfaction. So results from this survey uh, help us refine the understanding of energy poverty in the town of Bridgewater, but also in Canada more generally. This is the first study documenting in-depth energy poverty in any uh, community in Canada. Results provide a look into the lived experience of energy poverty and the trade-offs uh, people and households have to make to pay um, energy bills. And results also support recommendations on the measurements of energy poverty for energized bridge water and on the need for future research to document the health and well-being impact of energized bridge water um, in the community. All right, thank you very much. So I'll just conclude by uh, giving a very warm thank you to uh, Dr. Riva and her research team. This is really remarkable research. This is, as she said, the most in-depth uh, of this kind of research that's been done in Canada. We're very proud to be part of that. And if anything, it just uh, furthers our resolve to do something about this very, uh, you know, distressing issue that's, that's clearly very widespread in our community. The results actually validate 
uh, our earliest, our earlier projections of the rate of energy poverty in the community, which is really good to see. And uh, we will be taking Dr. Rivas' uh, recommendations, of course, very seriously moving forward. Uh, just one final thought uh, that I wanted to add, which is that no personally identifiable information is being transmitted from Dr. Rivas' team to anyone in the town. So no staff, nobody else will have access to any data other than sort of aggregate data from the survey. So that's being kept very, very confidential because obviously it's, it's uh, uh, information that we don't want anyone else to have access to. That's it. I'm happy to answer questions or invite uh, Dr. Riva to respond as well. Any questions from members of council? Councilor Thorburn. Yeah. This report is, is probably four and a half months old. And with the increase that we've seen in energy, I would think that those numbers that are being shown to us tonight would have increased because really it, it's gone up quite a bit so those numbers would be greater than what the presentation showed tonight. Would that be a fair statement? Dr. Riva, would you like to respond to that? Did you hear the question? Um, can you repeat, would you mind, that the, this number was cut in? Oh, Councillor Thorburn was indicating that um, because the survey was conducted in the spring, is it possible that the, um, that the numbers in the survey are now outdated because of rising energy costs? Yeah. Is, that, is that it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, but I would say outdated. Maybe the, the numbers will increase. We're hoping to conduct the same survey in the spring 2024, so in about a year and a half uh, from now. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that the numbers are outdated, but maybe that more people would now be in energy poverty because of the increase in energy bills, but also because of housing insecurity. Mm. Councilor McDonald. I'm um, just wondering if it, it, it's fair to say that those experiencing energy poverty would be more likely to respond to the survey, and if that is a fair statement, is there anything that you can do in your work to account for, for that in your results? That's a great question. Um, so I would say uh, it is more likely, but I'm not sure this is the case. So usually in population surveys, uh, people um, um, uh, with, with uh, lower income or lower, lower education are less likely to answer questions because, you know, they have more important things to do, right? And it, in our survey, we compare the socioeconomic profile of respondents to respondents of the town of Bridgewater. And it, it, it's quite similar. There are discrepancies. For example, there are much more women who answered the surveys than there are in the town of Bridgewater, proportional to men, right? But that's also something we see in any population surveys that women are more likely to, to respond. So in terms of socioeconomic characteristics of people that are associated with energy poverty, um, for me, I, I do not a clear signal that there might be a bias that more people in energy poverty uh, answered the survey. And when we actually compare results to um, energy poverty indicators that we were able to compute using data from the 2016 uh, Canadian census, the results are quite comparable. Um, and also, because we're using different indicators of energy poverty, we're using the 10% cutoff, the 5.4 the, the cutoff, we're using self-reported measure. So it, it's, it, it, these indicators tell us a different story around energy poverty. So results might be biased, but not by that much. We get 38% if we compute energy poverty with all people in Bridgewater using 2016 census data, right? If we, when the, the 2021 data will be made available, we will remake the computation to see if things have shifted, and then we can do it again um, with 
uh, data from the 2026 census when it becomes available. Thank you. Any other <coughs> questions? Councilor McDonald. More out of curiosity, uh, with a, a town of our population, what would be your goal response rate? I mean, 516 is, is good to us because we know it's very difficult to get people to respond. Um, but for, for really solid data, what would your goal be for a response? Yeah, another great question. Um, it, it's difficult to assess because so the survey was not designed to be representative because it's really hard for a community-based survey to be representative, but we recruited more than 10 people, 10, sorry, more than 10% of residents uh, uh, no, that's not true. Uh, uh, more than ten percent of households in the town participated, right? So that is um, that is huge to document the prevalence of energy poverty. I think we have a large enough sample size. When we, when the sample size will start to be limited, this is when we want to cross data, looking at. You know, the proportion of people in energy poverty living in certain types of dwelling, using certain, um, you know, using electricity or oil to, to heat their home. So, but, and if we're looking by age group or differences between men and women, so so we're, we're more limited in all the cross tabulations that we can make than um, assessing the, the, the prevalence of um, energy poverty. Uh, just to give you an indication, during the same time, we were trying to collect data on food, uh, in, in a study on food insecurity in Montreal in four different neighborhoods. We, um, we didn't have that much of a presence in the communities as we did in Bridgewater. We were opening for 200 people per neighborhood for a total of 800. We achieved 427 in four neighborhoods in Montreal that are vastly more populated than Bridgewater. So the response was astonishing in Bridgewater. Great, thank you. From my experience working in you know, conducting community-based surveys. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, more data gives us better information to make decisions. Mm -hmm. But this certainly, we've been going at this for for a, a little while now, and this just continues to reinforce that we're on the right track, which is mm -hmm. important, um, and that what we're doing is is quite representative from coast to coast. So it, it's it's very representative for Atlantic Canada, where there are generally high rates of energy poverty. For for, for from a coast to coast perspective. The work is is groundbreaking. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I, I will add that um, you know, uh, uh, Milan provided the sort of the high level outcomes from the work. Uh, we are already actively using some of the more nuanced findings from the from the the research to improve our program design. So that's that's actively taking place. Fantastic. Any other comments or questions? No, Dr. Reva, thank you so much for joining us. This, this is. Uh, Fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Milan. Good night. And to you and your team, Leon, thank you as well. Down to grants to organizations, and Kara uh, is here to uh, give us a presentation and some recommendations. Hello. Um, thank you. As um, some of you may know, my name is Kara Highfield. I'm filling in for Diana as the recreation and Active Communities Coordinator. Oh, she's away for a little bit. Um, so yes, I'm here to present the Grants to Organizations um, request for council decision for the September 30th deadline. Uh, this is the first intake for this fiscal period. And we had a budget of 29,000 um, for the full year um, with 12 applications um, for this deadline. And, and a total ask of $93,462.15. Um, so I met with councillors Mike Conklin and Andrew Tanner, um, and we are recommending giving eight of the applica applicants financial support, totaling $15,140, as outlined in the report. And this would leave $13,860 
um, for the March 1st deadline. Um, and would you like me to go to, and to speak to any of the applications specifically? Uh, I'll probably just ask if Council has any questions about any of them in particular. Okay. Just, yeah. Maybe a couple of comments because <laughs> this is not an enviable job. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we put you on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking for Councilor Conklin and I both. Um, just so the public knows, like there's policy that guides us and binds us to some of the decisions we're making. Uh, financials are required, so some of these organizations that don't submit financials, um, I'm sorry, but that's what we need and, and to make some of these decisions. And I know you'll see some organizations in there that perhaps should be funded for some things, but without that financial information, that's, that's where, we're, where we're left at despite several requests. Um, I know that staff uh, are working really hard with a couple of organizations to, uh, to find them alternative avenues of funding and other options, so we're, we're taking that into account, and thank you, Kayla, for doing that. Um, you'll note that Flourish has been requested, or it's been suggested that they come present to us, because I think we're in the same sort of um, area that we are with the YMCA youth group, where Flourish is a seniors organization that's really growing, and I think they're probably going to come back year after year or quarter after quarter uh, requesting some funding from us to continue to grow that air and that, um, that um, organization. So I think it's wise that we sort of listen to them and see where they're going with it and so on. Um, in our defense, the Nova Scotia Country Music Hall of Fame, we, we like that organization, um, but the, the event has already happened. So it's not like they need the money to put the, the uh, event on, so that was sort of our justification there. Um, and, uh, and then we wanted, uh, as Kayla said, we wanted some money left over to tackle what may be coming the next round of applications. So, so that's sort of our justification of that from a uh, human perspective. No, I appreciate the explanation, um, especially on, like, like you said, we have, we have policy and it's there so that every organization follows the same set of criteria and, and so I know we have some that didn't provide the information and you, that you have to say no then, but the opportunity was there. So, Councillor Caldwell. I, I seem to recall our last round, did we um, discuss uh, reviewing the, the policy and the criteria at some point? Um, I know we talked about you, you say uh, like operational yeah. funding, ongoing funding, and did we want to do that or not? So is that something we're going to look at? You did ask that we take a look at, either way it's a grant. It's just yeah. about where we show it in the budget. So um, if there's a, say, Flourish or the Y Youth Program, if it's decided that those types of things are more operational because they come every year, yeah. it's still a grant, but we just budgeted some results. Um, so you did ask that we kind of take a look at what would be ongoing operating grants that we may want to just incorporate into our budget. So Jessica and Diana do have that on, on the work program. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Is someone prepared to make a motion? Deputy Mayor Fugier? Yes, Your Worship, I'll make a motion. The Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorsed the recommendation of the Grants to Organizations Committee and awards grants for the September 30th intake period as follows. $1,000 to Big Brothers Big Sisters So Shore, $5,000 to Canadian Tire Para Hockey Cup, $2,500 to Flourish, $2,000 to Bridgewater and Area Food Bank, $500 to Lunaburg County Judo, $1,500 for So Shore Sexual Health, and $2,500 for South Shore Minor Hockey Association and $140 to Universal Cheer. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Caldwell, further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Those opposed, motion is carried. Thank you very much. 9.3, grant uh, designated community funds project, Firefighters Association of Bridgewater. Um, Oh, Kim is on giving a presentation for that. Good evening. Sorry, I have trouble hearing you at that time. We cut out, so I didn't, didn't hear you right away. Um, so this report is regarding donations that have been received by the County of Bridgewater under the designated community project fund policy. 
and we've received $129,000 plus $30.69 mm -hmm. um, with the request that it be designated for the Firefighters Association of Bridgewater. So the next step, um, upon the request of the Firefighters Association, um, we're coming to council with a request to release uh, or issue a grant to them in that amount. Um, and so that is the that's the basis of the report. There's a little more detail in there, but, but it's pretty simple in the sense that the number of times I feel like at least once a month we go through this process um, with the number of organizations in that system. Yeah, any questions on that? As the director finance said, we do this with the field house quite often, so it's the same mm -hmm. kind of same, same kind of thing. So we're not uh, we're not giving money, we're giving them the money that was given for them. <laughs> so just giving it back to them. That's that's exactly it. So is someone prepared to make a motion? Council Thorburn. I would move that Council with Town of Bridgewater approve a grant from the designated communities project fund in the amount of one hundred and twenty nine thousand five hundred and thirty dollars and sixty nine cents to the Firefighters Association of Bridgewater in support of the fire service within the town of Bridgewater. Wonderful. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Fragier. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Down to our first quarter 2022 23 financial report. All right. I'm just going to share my screen for this one. Um, I think Um, everyone has the reports in front of them, um, so we are going to just go through that. The, you have the written report. I'm just going to go through the operating statement first, um, so that should give you um, a look at that. I've highlighted in blue in that operating statement with things um, of note with more significant variances. So the first one is Dean Transfer Tax. So Dean Transfer Tax is quite significantly um, over the quarter budget. So the $600,000 budget is for the whole year. Um, and in the first three months, the actual is at $257,000. So it's quite a bit over budget at this point. Um, and next quarter, we'll likely be able to project it where we think that will be at year end or a little bit closer than we could at the end of the first quarter. For sales and service, there's a number of things there. Um, police fees for service um, being most of that variance, that's, that's over budget by about $58,000 based on higher than expected usage. For other revenue from other sources, there's a couple of things going on there, um, but for the most part, there's an overall um, $30,000 under budget. Part of that is from school cemetery sales compared to budget as well as pro kids donations that haven't come in. And the final item affecting that would be that building and development fees are below budget um, in the first quarter, but that is expected to um, be within budget by the event. So just a little bit behind, if you remember last year we were ahead of budget early on. Um, so that one fluctuates just depending on activity. For the conditional transfers from other governments, um, that's expected to be under budget um, at the end of the year as a result of a grant of application that wasn't approved. Um, but as of the first quarter, we'd actually been over budget because there was a grant received from the problems for fire services um, that was unanticipated when the budget was prepared. On the expenditure side, a few things to note. Under financial management, most of the variance is as a result of professional development um, being a little bit slower to start, and likely some more of that being used up in the fall, and the um, audit will be still to at, at that point in time because the audit is only completed in September. On the police side, um, due to understaffing, there's more overtime and more accrued vacation of things that haven't been taken uh, at that point. Because remember, we're talking about up to June 30th. On the fire protection side, um, also under budget as a result of less than anticipated use of um, fire inspection services from the municipality, the district of Lindbergh, um, and less maintenance on vehicles at that point. 
Under other protective services, which is also significantly under budget by 51,000 as a result of not having been invoiced by the municipality of the District of Columbia for building inspection services up to June 30th. Under common services, there's just a, a couple of small things there, mostly related to vacant staff positions um, and higher than anticipated fuel costs which is a common theme in the quarterly report. For environmental health, um, few repairs on the wastewater treatment plants and budgeted and some staff vacancies have resulted in some year-to-date savings. But under recreational parks and playgrounds, um, mostly um, the variance is under budget, which is usually a good thing, the result of a facility sign which um, likely won't be completed in the fiscal year um, and no port body is being required at shipyards this year due to construction. Under festivals, um, it's just timing because this is up to June 30th and we are missing some uh, Canada Day invoices that will show up in the next quarter. So that's all of the operating items. The capital budget um, is there for you as well. Um, because it's kind of the in the beginning parts of construction season up to June 30th, not um, a significant amount there as the most of its projects underway. Um, you'll note there's a number of projects that were noted as deferred um, that were identified after the budget process that due to staffing they likely wouldn't get completed in the fiscal year. So those are those are noted there and that would continue on through the fiscal year not likely. Is there any questions? Any questions from members of council on this? No, quiet group now. <laughs> nope, Councilor Thorburn, I knew if I just if I just paused long enough. Yes, uh, Kim, with the fire protection and the other protective services under budget now, uh, I would expect that later on those numbers would catch up and at least be uh, balanced by years in? Yeah, a large part of that, that fire protection, well, part of it is maintenance of equipment, so you're at the mercy of when, when, when they buy it. Um, the equipment decides to need maintenance to some degree, so we usually anticipate using most of that by year end, but we'll have a better sense um, in the next couple of quarters where that's leading. And then the fire inspection services, again, we're at the, the mercy of um, you know, what our a contract with modal provides and uh, the time they have available. Yes. That's great. Thank you. Other comments or questions? No. All right. On to the next. Are you? Were you done? Did you have something else? <laughs> I just. <laughs> I just saw, <laughs> like this anticipation, like I wasn't done. Um, 9.5 group benefit plan uh, review. Kim again. Kim again, yeah. <laughs> All right, that's the last one, I think. So um, we just wanted to bring forth um, a report on our group benefit plan. Um, there's, you know, the background and information is there in the report, but essentially um, <coughs> it came to management's attention that you know, staff had some concerns about our group, and group benefit plan. It came up during recruitment um, and retention discussions um, with staff. And so um, it was asked that we review them. So we went to our consultant to assist us with our group benefit plan and have them compare the town's current group benefit plan with um, the province, other similar size municipalities, as well as just the private sector. And so um, that information is available in this report as well, but it basically the summary is that there's a couple of areas where we're lacking um, in coverage, and one of those is vision coverage, um, because our coverage amounts to about $100 for vision, including an eye exam, which um, if anyone's had an eye exam, that's, that's quite low, and definitely wouldn't cover eyeglasses in addition to the eye exam. Um, whereas other plans have coverage that's more in the $150 to $250 range plus um, the eye exam is separate. So that, that's quite a significant area uh, where we were lacking in coverage. And then the other piece of that would be paramedical practitioners, which are things such as 
um, chiropractor and physiotherapy, so our coverage is $200 per practitioner. Um, and that's about half of what you're seeing in comparable plans. So our recommendation is that um, council consider the list of um, recommended um, options as, uh, sorry, <laughs> the list of recommended options, which the cost for um, the last three months of the fiscal period would be about for a maximum of $7,500 as some of that will be shared um, with the employees. Forgive me, my cold is catching up with me. Too much speaking at once. Um, and so, you know, we really feel that gives us a unique competitive comparison with other employers, with the province, and other local municipalities. All right. Uh, any questions on that? Councilor Carwell. Uh, after HUB prepared the review, was it taken back to staff and what, were the, what was the response we, in general? Uh, we worked with the Management Labor Relations Committee, who um, staff are on the committee representing their various departments, so non-union. And um, so they were the ones who actually had initiated this, the non-union. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been any discussions with the union, but this plan would apply to all employees. Mm -hmm. And the response was favorable, I assume. From the Management Labor Relations yeah. Committee, yes, yeah. they, yeah, they, they wanted to see the change. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Some are prepared to make a motion. Council Caldwell, move the council for the town of Bridgewater approve the recommended changes as an unbudgeted un expenditure in the town's group health plan, based on the improvements recommended <coughs> with the effective date of January first, two thousand twenty-three or as soon as possible after that date at a maximum budget of $7,500 to March 31st, 2023. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Tanner. Further discussion? Question. Question be called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you to staff and the committee for that. Uh, recommendation of the Downtown Planning Advisory Committee, citizen appointment. Is someone prepared to make that motion. Councilor McDonald. We move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater appoint James Houghton as resident member for to serve on the Heritage Advisory Committee effective immediately for a three-year term. Okay, we'll do the Heritage Advisory first. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's fine. Do you want me to do the other one now? <laughs> well, let's do this one <laughs> first. Okay. Yeah. Well, do I have a second here? So, <laughs> Councilor Caldwell, all those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so now, now 9.6 for uh, <laughs> Downtown Planning Advisory Committee. Did you know this one? <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Yeah, it's all yours now. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater appoint Katerina Beck as resident representative to sit on the Downtown Planning Advisory Committee for a three-year term effective immediately. Perfect. Seconded by, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Councillor Tanner. Thank you. Oh, I, th I thought I was going to make it to the end. Oh, so close. I've done, I'm so proud of myself. Yeah. I'm going to have a lollipop later. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. I was going to have one regardless. All right. <laughs> um, 9.8, recommendation of the Bridgewater Museum Commission citizen appointment. Someone prepared to make that motion? Councilor Caldwell. Move the Council for the Town of Bridgewater, appoint Katarina Beck to serve on the Bridgewater Museum Commission for a three-year term, effective Monday, November 14, 2022, expiring on November 13, 2025. Perfect. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Thurburn. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, we have our monthly permit report for October uh, 2022 there for not just Council's uh, review, but the, that for the public as well. So we continue to be um, quite busy. So that's good. And I would encourage you, if you have any questions, reach out to um, either to staff or to the CAO if you have um, questions on that. And then we have the Lunenburg County Senior Safety Program monthly report for October as well for people's review. And uh, I know I sound like a broken record, but I don't know where we'd be without this organization and all they do for the seniors in our community. So that is there. Um, 
And uh, again, if you have any questions, you can reach out to the um, members of that organization. Uh, 9.11, we have the briefing note from our discussion session last week. So one of those topics is uh, on the agenda today. Um, and then the other was uh, from Tapestry and the, um, the Energy Investment System Model. And then the Heritage Advisory Committee request, um, I thought those were great discussions. And I thank uh, Deputy Mayor Fugier, who uh, jumped in and chaired that meeting while I was out of town. So thank you for that. So, and I, I was always encouraged, these are all posted online on bridgewater.ca, so under the council section. Um, so I would encourage people, if you go down, you can see agendas and minutes, those are all there, and you can review those. Um, and then reach out to any of us if you have any questions. So down to 9.12, pre-budget approval and project acceleration for separate stormwater, uh, storm sewer, sorry, for St. Philip Streets. Welcome, Audrey. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so this evening, um, as part of the 2022-23 exit 12A capital upgrades, town council did approve $2.268 million to upgrade the existing water main on St. Philip Street. And the size was going from a 6-inch main up to a 24-inch water main on that street. So we've been in the detailed design phase now for several months on this project and we're just getting to the stage where we're seeing the impacts to the street. And of course this water main upgrade is being used to provide the future BDA lands north of the 103. And give them sufficient capacity for the new booster station that's slotted to be built. During this design phase we determined that the impacts on the street, in particular the wastewater infrastructure, was going to be fairly significant and due to the congestion on the street it would also have large impacts to all the residents in the uh, water main replacement section. To minimize the infrastructure disruption and the impacts to residents and the overall cost of the project, staff took a look at our 10-year town wastewater capital budget and we did determine that there is a project on that in future years in the stor separated storm sewer on St. Philip's Wharf that was originally scheduled to happen in 2029-30. We'd like to accelerate that to this coming year, 2022. 23 for the design phase and 2023-24 for the construction phase. The overall budget for that entire project is approximately $2 million and it would replace storm infrastructure along with upgrading the sanitary sewer on St. Philip Street. This project was already part of our larger 10-year program and it would just mean accelerating it to the to an earlier stage in the process. To combine with the water upgrades uh, and the stormwater and sanitary upgrades, this would commence immediately in the fall with the design phase and construction would follow with a spring tender to try and get our best pricing possible. In order to do this, we are requesting the council accelerate the 2029-30 wastewater capital project for separate storm sewers on St. Philip Street work at an estimated cost of $2 million net HSD into the capital budget for 2022-23 and 2023-24. This would require council to provide an unbudgeted 2022-23 and pre-budget 2023-24 approval for the design and construction of separate storm sewer St. Philip Street work at an estimated cost of $2 million net, H net HST. The design that would happen in 2022-23, it has an estimated cost of $200,000, and the construction that would follow would have an estimated cost of approximately $1.8 million, both net HST. The $2 million funds required to complete the project being provided by grants and debt with the construction phase not proceeding unless grant funding is approved. Are there any questions? Certainly makes sense to do it. Like if you're going to tear up the road, <laughs> tear up the road once. So uh, the, the logic is, is there. It seems 
2930 seems so far out, but it's it would be a shame to tear up a road a few years later and <laughs> disrupt everyone again. Um, any questions from members of council? Is someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Fugier, I'm sorry, yeah. Deputy Mayor Fugier. <laughs> Um, yes, I move that Council accelerate the 2029-30 wastewater capital project for separate <coughs> storm sewer, St. Phillips Street work at an estimated cost of $2 million into the capital budget for 2022-23 and 2023-24 with the design to commence in the fall of 2022-23 with construction following immediately after design. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Tanner. Brilliant discussion. <laughs> All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. I'm going to get a little piece of, like, a little sticker that says Councillor and then Deputy Mayor over there. I'll get it. I got two years to get it right. <laughs> oh, there's a second motion? I didn't see a second motion. Give me a moment. Oh, yeah, there it is. Look at that. Um, yep. Yes, you thank ready? you. <laughs> okay. Um, I move that council provide unbudgeted 2022-23 and pre-budget 2023-24 approval for the design and construction of separate storm sewer for St. Philip Street work at an estimated cost of two million net HST, with design to commence in 2022-23 estimated at $200,000 net HST and construction to follow immediately after design with anticipated construction start in the 2023-24 year estimated at 1,800,000 net HST with the $2 million funds required to complete the project being provided by grants and debt with construction phase not proceeding unless grant funding is approved. Thank you, seconded by mm -hmm. Councillor Tanner. Further discussion? Question. Question be called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. 9.13 Business Park Expansion Delineation of Contaminated Soil Area. Okay. So, if the council recalls, um, probably about two months ago, staff came to council to advise that um, we, we do have some contaminated soil on town lands. And we the area of which we're looking at part of our business park expansion along the proposed uh, along the soon to be connector road that goes down to St. Philip Street and that we had a requirement to delineate the extent of that contamination um, one for um, environmental reasons for the Department of Environment but secondly because we need to, to know that as we get ready to market the land exactly where that was so we approved or council approved to 54,000 to have that the delineation, the test pits done, the testing, the soil analysis, and the reporting done on that work. Uh, staff have heard back from Stantec, just what, the email was on Friday, late Friday, and um, it advised that um, there were some test pits that came back as samples that were exceeded the allowable limits, so that meant that we needed further test pits. So they've identified that I believe there are five extra test pits that are required to be to be uh, undertaken, and these would um, be outside of the area that was uh, kind of identified. And so it's to kind of keep following it until it, we don't follow it anymore. Um, the additional cost is fourteen thousand five hundred ninety-seven dollars, excluding HST. So that would be in addition to what we've already approved to have that work completed. Um, I did talk to staff to say, is there a chance that this could be done this fiscal <coughs> year? Because we're, we're heading, heading into the winter season, so there's some question about whether or not they could get the testing done um, before the ground wasn't conducive for it. Um, and we're, we're going to try if council gives the budget approval to do that, as opposed to wait until the next fiscal year. And that's simply so that we can identify that area and as we say council wants to, to to have us look at some marketing plans and and look at some lot layouts and those types of things and this is critical information for that as well plus i think it would be good to know as soon as we can what what the extent of the area is that we're we're dealing with 
So um, while there is no report for council tonight because it is a, a, a new development that came in um, late Friday and on the weekend, um, we have got the estimate from the consultant and that's what we'd be looking for is approval uh, from council with an additional um, value of 15000 and that would be pre-HST, pre so that excludes HST. And um, that would be added to our um, money that we've already spent, which would be in addition to the 54000 yeah. <coughs> Any questions on that? Is someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Caldwell? May I just clarify oh. the amount yep. is 14 it's fi it's I, I rounded it up to 15 It was 14597 so, the so, yes, I, I sent the wrong you refresh. It okay, we should say 15. Yeah, 15 okay. instead of 14. Yeah. Yes. Round it up. <laughs> <laughs> I move that Council authorize an additional unbudgeted expenditure of $15,000 for the de delineation of contaminated soil, air, contaminated soil air area as part of the Exit 12A Business Park project. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Thorburn. Further discussion? Question hearing none. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. We're down to uh, business rising, unfinished business. 10.1 Yarmouth, uh, Yarmouth, Maine Ferry Service request for letter of support. Um, <coughs> so, as we know, the request came from. Oh, is yep, he's here. Greg's going to talk to. Oh, Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening. <coughs> Uh, I, I won't go through the whole report. I basically, uh, essentially, the report originates from the uh, request received from uh, from the town of Airman with respect to the letter of support for the catering service. Uh, maybe it was, that was received around October fourth. Uh, essentially, the recommendation is for council to defer a decision respecting a letter of support uh, for ongoing subsidization of the ferry operation until recently announced the economic impact assessment study has been completed by the province and the results of the share. Uh, the bulk of the report is providing you with just some background and history on the ferry service. Uh, it's obviously been a big part of the community of Yarmouth for well over 100 years. Um, and it's played a pivotal part in, uh, you know, some of the predecessor services played a major role in the in the uh, tour the of the tourism industry in the province at that time. Um, the two ferry services, one was uh, recently was uh, established in 1956, when the second one established in '82, and those two services really provided the high point of ferry travel. Uh, by both the year 2002 of 330,000 passengers annually. Uh, the town, you know, has been uh, intricately connected with with the ferry service uh, and certainly uh, has witnessed a big change in its various transportation uh, needs and options uh, over the past 40 years uh, from having several, uh, two ferries and air service, bus service, those sorts of things to most of that now uh, being discontinued. So the, I also provided you with some background on the last sort of significant assessment that was undertaken in 2012 by a panel of experts which, which didn't make a recommendation but rather sort of define what what was needed for a, for a viable Ferry service, uh, and I think if you look at the findings uh, of their report, uh, and you compare that with um, with what actually transpired uh, from 2015, say moving forward to the present, uh, some of those uh, things you know fell short. So certainly the the uh, the, uh, the numbers have not reached what was recommended back at that time, which was about 100. 30,000 passengers a year, um, and the, 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 uh, the break-even point of about seven years was certainly not uh, not achieved, and that was obviously impacted by the pandemic. Uh, the projected subsidy of 30 to 35 million dollars uh, was actually 61 million dollars, 
over the period of 2015 to 2019. And of course, there were issues around the terminal that uh, most of you would be aware of that, that weren't inspected at that time and it, it caused further issues for the service. Uh, so basically, from, from the resumption of the service in 2016, there was about 35,500 uh, travelers that year. That increased to 41,600 in, uh, in the following year, and up to 50,000 in 2018. Um, there was then a, then a lack of a terminal for 2019, which, which uh, caused the, the service to, to be delayed in 20 and 20, 20 and 21 were both canceled during the pandemic. So the result for last year was 36,000 travelers. Uh, at the end of the season, and while we were preparing the report, essentially the, the province released those as the final numbers for the year and indicated their intention to undertake a, an economic impact assessment of the of the service. So, um, so the impacts for 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 the for the town of Bridgewater uh, are such that there is no real direct uh, impact. Uh, on the town's financial position as it relates to the ferry service. However, uh, if we see a change in policy and a subsequent redirection of, of the uh, resources that had been put into the ferry service into a more broad application across the western Nova Scotia, that may have a, a positive impact on the community if we're deemed to be eligible for that type of support uh, in tandem with other, other communities. And the options, I guess, before us are would be to accept the recommendation to defer the decision pending the receipt of the impact assessment report, or revise the recommendation to provide a letter without any conditions or reference to that assessment, or to decline to, to provide a letter of support uh, uh, in any form. So, um, and with that, I take any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Greg. <coughs> That's very good information. Anyone have any questions? Just I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna say there was an article like two weeks mm -hmm. ago in the paper, um, making what I thought was an assumption that when council said, you know, we wanted um, to suggest to the province that they do an economic impact study, that 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 particular outlet saw that as the town not supporting the ferry. And what I explained to to the mayor of Yarmouth was that's not what that was at all. It was we don't know, like we don't have enough information. We just went through detailed survey results on, on um, energy poverty and came away with, well, more data gives us better decision-making um, options. And so I think uh, having that economic impact study of the ferry, um, you know, unless you're looking through a lens of determined to make sure it fails, which maybe that's part of what this article <laughs> is trying to to come away with, but the, I, I didn't think that was, that was not the sense I got from Bridgewater Town Council. It was, we'd like to know what the ferry, the, you know, the impact of the ferry. So <clears throat> anyway, now I just wanted to clarify that because I did have a couple of our colleagues say, why don't you support the ferry? And I had to explain that that is not at all anywhere close to what we said. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, any questions for Mr. Brown or someone prepared to make a motion? Oh, okay, Councilor McDonald. <laughs> I've moved that. Am I on the right one? Yeah. I've moved that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater defer a decision respecting a letter of support for ongoing subsidization of the ferry operation until the recently announced economic impact assessment study has been completed by the province and the results of same have been provided to the municipal units. Thank you. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Fougier. Further discussion? Question. Question be called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. 10.2 Bridgewater Memorial Arena Auditorium Second Floor Renovations Review of Renovation Budget uh, and Project Scope.
Oh, you don't often see a red town of Bridgewater. Sure. That's <laughs> kinda, I can see I can see Castle Thorburn <laughs> taking a look like, oh, I, that's a sharp. I like it. That's it's a, a sharp, 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 sharp look. Sharp, sharp. It's exactly. Made it easier when it comes to my wardrobe in the morning now, and I just bought ten of them. <laughs> ten different colors. I'm good now. It's like that I'm movie. Red, it's it's like that movie Free Guy, where he just picks the same blue shirt every day. So makes it easy. There you I go. Think that's an engineer trait, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening. Um, last we spoke. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, last we spoke uh, with regards to the BMA renovations, uh, we were here to uh, council decide or elected not to award the heat pump, the ducted heat pump project um, because of due to being over budget and direct staff to come back with an updated report on the renovations uh, along with costing. So staff have taken the time and Kirk is here with me this evening uh, if anything needs to be elaborated on. Uh, we looked at the scope and budget and we concluded that uh, at the time when we constructed a five-year build-up for the facility in January 2021 uh, that really the uh, projects for the 22-23 years and beyond are no, the budgets for those are no longer appropriate due to the shortages we've seen over the past you know, 24 months or more um, and the inflation rates driving prices up considerably. Um, also, we've noticed or we found that the scope needs to be adjusted or expanded uh, for attic insulation, drywall repairs, uh, washroom stall replacement and flooring as well. Um, it was noted in the last report that uh, staff were made aware of a significant uh, raccoon infestation in the attic of the auditorium uh, and it needs to be uh, professionally restored or uh, remediate before uh, any further uh, renovations can be done. Uh, for the health and safety of staff and the public and contractors. Um, so we, we did reach out to a number of firms um, with only one firm getting back to us uh, and they provided a quote of $79,257.36 at HST. They can complete the work within two weeks of award. Uh, the firm is Paul Davis Restoration. Uh, currently the facility or that section is closed off to staff. We are, or we have been in contact with engineering firms to do some air quality testing, so that we kind of know how we can continue our work in the area until it is remediated, or if it is remediated. Uh, at this time, there's no real movement on that uh, uh, scheduling of work with the contract of the engineering firm at this time. I do note in, and highlight it there that in that we're not aware of any other issues with respect to the BMA um, and, and that would hinder the redevelopment. We've, uh, I've provided a table uh, below or in the report. Uh, the items <coughs> highlighted in red are those that we wish to continue uh, this fiscal year uh, and then items in uh, black font would be ones we would, uh, we would propose in next year's uh, budget for council's consideration. Uh, it is imperative if we are going to continue with redevelopment of the BMA uh, that we do complete the remediation. Um, we staff feel that we there is sufficient time uh, to complete the chairlift that has been already awarded and the wheelchair ramp. Uh, both of those have funding attached to those. Uh, we have been talking with the building inspector and it was noted that in order to occupy the first floor uh, of the BMA, uh, we do need to put in a, a small fire separation uh, for f at $15,500 uh, 15, um, and that, this would separate transit and parks from the first floor occupied space uh, where the old former kitchen would be. Uh, we estimate the items in red um, to be at a cost of 248000 this year. Uh, those that remain were, and we're asking to be deferred to next year for as part of the deliberation process would be estimated at 225000 uh, It should be noted that there was already 210000 in next year's or proposed budget for 23-24 and there may be duplication, uh, meaning that, and what I say by that is that they there was already plans to put a wall in uh, to separate uh, transit parks from the farmer's market. So if we in fact do a smaller wall this year, that may no longer be required or could be deferred into future years if it's determined the need. There's also uh, replacement of doors or heating electrical that some of that may be incorporated this year or next year. Um, but staff would need the time to really delve into that a little deeper through the budget uh, budgeting process to make sure there is no duplication and the budget is accurate for next year. Um, we know, we understand that the BMA and its redevelopment is important uh, and a strategic priority. 
so we've provided staff, a council, staff have provided council three options. Um, one, uh, option one was direct staff with, to do complete alternative procurement for the remediation of the attic space with Paul Davis restoration, as well as complete the chair lift and deferring all work until next year. Uh, option two would be direct staff to complete the alternative procurement for the restoration of the attic space, as well as complete all the specified items in red uh, this fiscal year. Uh, because we have the time complete, uh, to complete those items, uh, but it would be over budget. I, mean, I made an error in there, not by 248000 it should be 48000 is what we estimate, my apologies. Um, and then any of the remaining work, those, in that, those items in black and within the charge would be deferred to next year uh, or defer any decision and request further information. Uh, staff have uh, recommended to go with option two. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Questions? Our engineer, Councillor Tanner. Matt, what do you think it would cost to get a uh, like an outsourced facility condition assessment done on that building? Uh, I get, based on my limited experience, uh, and if we're focusing only on the, f depending on how uh, uh, large the scope is, the entire facility or just the front part, um, normally those assessments run from in, in the tens of thousands, like ten to, to twenty thousand. At this point, considering that we've opened up every, almost every crevice of the BMA so far in its renovations, the attic space is the last one, we'll say. Um, I'm not sure if, if that would be a uh, justified expense at this point. I'm not sure. Um, I'm just to be concerned about we would spend money on assessment when we're pretty much, if we continue, if we go with the restoration, we're going to see most of it. That's what's left, I guess. I have a few questions. Sure. Can I keep going? <laughs> yes, you can. Um, have we looked at air quality and air handling systems in that facility and given uh, the mix of use? Uh, at this point, there is, uh, as part of the, uh, when we, we came with our first report uh, for, for the ductic heated system, uh, we declined that because it was only focusing on the mini split. Uh, as part of the 80,000 in this uh, call uh, in the tra table here, uh, we'd be looking at heating with an air exchanger as well for that, that part of the building. Only. Yeah, I guess I was looking at air quality given that we're bringing large equipment in and out of there, that kind of thing, and you know, running, I assume it's running to drive it into the facility yeah. and where does that air go and yeah. Uh, at this point, we I, that's <coughs> unless Kirk, if there's anything you can add to that, I know we are uh, planning to install the fire separation, which should uh, kind of eliminate most of that. Uh, cross contamination uh, of the air and, and incorporating the air exchanger and the heat uh, heat pumps that were, I guess, planned in the budget it should take care of that. But yeah. again, that that is a, a valid concern. Um, you noted reinstatement of washrooms. What does that mean? Like, uh, to, to in my recollection, there's not a whole lot of washrooms on that upper l floor. If we're d having social players there and so on, does that mean they have to go down the elevator if they're if, they're, uh, if they need accessibility and, and use the lower level washrooms, or how does that work? A very good point in one area um, that uh, in discussions with Kirk and other staff that the, the expanded scope seems to be doing more on the second floor for uh, washrooms than maybe originally anticipated. So I'd like to have more of the con conversation around that to say what was in scope before I think was doing the bare minimum uh, with respect to having accessible washrooms, uh, gender neutral, um, and what's in the budget now could be a little bit more elaborate. Um, and that's where I would need to take some time to delve into that a little bit more. Okay. So we've, what we've tried to provide is kind of a worst case uh, on that one. Um, I don't know if Kirk, I apologize going back and forth looking at you Kirk, you're out of camera, but is there anything in terms of the washrooms that you can add on that one? There's two existing washrooms up there, uh, multi stall. Right. There was a male and female. Yeah. Two or three stall each. And they, so sure the players have requested that they can come gender neutral. Right. So we we do do that, and it's not the same that it cost not much more to uh, change the salt or removing the urinals But isn't there a, a ratio requirement based on attendance? Like if, if there's 150 people up there, you have to have X amount of washrooms per eight people or something like. I don't know what the ratio is, but you guys, yeah. Sort of. Yeah. yeah, so we would know that or we would have that yeah. in our plan. But I, uh, but the, the extent of the renovations, I guess, where I was focused on, well, we'll have the required per, per code, how, how, um, how well we renovate those areas initially um, could, 
impact the budget that I'm suggesting, which is, I guess, at this point, we're, um, su I'm suggesting a higher budget that may be required, and that's where I'd like time to review that for the 23-24 budget year to kind of possibly scale back some of those renovations if we're just looking at occupancy and then maybe deferring future upgrades to other years if uh, subject to funding and things like that. Okay. Um, you noted, sorry, okay. you noted electrical upgrades. Um, do we know what the social players' lighting systems and that kind of thing are going to require, and do we have that? Like, is is that all in the plan, you know? I don't know. That, that I don't know, to okay. be honest with you. Okay. I, I don't have the, uh, I wasn't part of the original. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, Kirk. Here comes uh, Kirk. So I wasn't <laughs> part of the original discussions or with the social players. Right. They have provided us with a, a rough idea of what they're looking for. Okay. Uh, I haven't gone into detail to figure out exactly where they want certain plugs and, and the lighting, but we have a rough idea of okay. capacities. So, but the electrical upgrade line item covers all of that off? Yeah, okay. mostly would be um, lighting and uh, panel upgrades, but okay. it does include right. their portions as well. And then there's also, my last one, there's also a note about exterior reno siding and windows. Has That hasn't been done as of yet, correct? To to the deep, to, to the level that I think is probably referred to? No, I believe that's in the 23-24 budget. Yeah, so yeah, that was a that was a prior report. Yeah, but 24, 25th yeah. five yeah. year. Um, yeah, we have completed okay. the red of the siding around a portion of the building thus far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but there is ninety thousand for for more energy upgrades okay. uh, for siding windows in the twenty four twenty five budget. My, I guess my fear in asking all these questions is that every time we kind of turn around, the numbers go up and up and up, and I'm I'm very fearful that. I'm going to, in essence, make a decision that's going to saddle a future council with in order to get the project to completion. And we really don't know those future numbers, and at least from everything I've seen, I don't have confidence that we know those future numbers, and that's why I'm asking those questions. So, thank you. Can I say one? Yep. Uh, with the siding, we do have materials on hand to do the entire back this winter. That was our winter project. Uh, uh, we do have enough materials to do. If you've noticed, we've done the lower half, lower right half of the front mm -hmm. the siding. We right. do have enough materials to do the lower left half. We haven't done that because of the windows. Gotcha. Didn't want to cover up the windows and then have to redo them later. But we did do the right <coughs> half because of the uh, wheelchair ramp. We had to fix the siding before we put the ramp on. So by the end of the winter, it will go better. Gotcha. And we'll save some of that future budget money. Your questions were good. Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Mayor, for sure. Um, just thinking of energy, um, has the building ever gone an energy audit? I don't know if it's applicable or if, um, you know, there's different, and I don't know where we're in municipal government, if it would apply for different funding yeah, rebates we one, can. But I think it probably yeah. be more incorporated into the renovation as opposed to an, an audit, right? Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah, I'm not sure what an energy yes, audit so cost would be, but I know, yeah, you know, sir, it's... have never gone through an audit, no. Um, like, under the cost of the commercial audit. Yeah, the yeah. Residential audit, you're looking at two, three hundred. Right, million. right. So I don't so know the scope of what it is, but where you're considering um, the heat pump system, which is a major investment, I was just wondering if there would be uh, a benefit of looking at an energy audit and recommendations. Yeah, drastically fail right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and just even things from, you know, we're, we're heat loss or drafts, simple things that can help in space heating and um, overall efficiencies, I guess, at the end of the day. So, If that's something the council is interested in, we could probably separate the forward part of the building from the storage part. Because the storage part will never seal up as in the state that it's in. It's basically an open air shell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but we should be able to, once we put the um, fire separation wall mm -hmm. in, it will physically separate the buildings into two pieces. Yeah. So then you should be able to do a test on the front portion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that having our on site energy manager, who's done now, but can provide some advice on, on what. <coughs> Options there are to incorporate that into the design. Mm. I got Kim's cold. <coughs> How did you get her cold through the, through tears? <laughs> but it's more of a 
when we're renovating, right? To, to look at incorporating it at that time. I'm assuming that um, <clears throat> having a grant coordinator on staff that we've yep. looked, reached out, looked at other grants. Like I, yep. we're seeing announcements from different municipalities across the province for upgrades, whether it's arenas or I think there was even one for performing arts. Um, so I'm assuming that we can oh, yeah. probably yeah. look into tapping yeah. into some well, of those. If, if we're incorporating <coughs> any type of energy efficiency component to the building, then Emily can look at what grants may be available through efficiency or any other types of... But even money. for culture and heritage, I'm assuming there's... Oh, yeah, they would look at more than that. Yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. Okay. We've, we've, we're scoping those things out all Just the time. Just if I may have follow up with that, I know with the residential, you're required to have it the audit done prior to any uh, changes, and then a follow up after everything is done. So it's kind of like the p part of the planning stage that you have to have it done before any anything is purchased or modified. So mm. yeah, it might be worth asking. Yeah, uh, well, I can get Emily to give us a report on what's been scoped out and um, what what grants are available. I know we have looked at grants through the Recreation Facility Grant Development Program and also through a COA. And at the time, they COA wanted the big project. They weren't, and, and we made a decision based on budget that we had to go small. And with the Recreation Facility Development Grant, it, we didn't get a grant under that program either, although we applied. But um, she's, yeah, she's constantly looking at what's on our capital and, and what grants are out there that we can match that to. It was noted in one of the big blue file would be that uh, this project wouldn't, uh, or I guess was slated to proceed based on getting 50% funding yeah. for each aspect. And uh, I, I would note in the original feasibility study around it, uh, staff did provide an estimate of, estimate of for renovations around $850,000 in total. Um, so we're, we're certainly, I believe, we're still within that range that it was originally given in, in 2020 or 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, for the VMA. Mm -hmm. That's good. Councillor Caldwell? Um, yeah, I was, uh, I really want this project to go forward. I was, I was disappointed to see so many things uh, added that um, sort of increased the price tag. It sounds as though, now that you've got things opened up, you can sort of reassure us that there shouldn't be any big surprises going forward. Certainly, the, the, the next big step with remediation, we should have most of everything opened up. Uh, so if, if certainly if staff was, a, was made aware of a, a new hindrance, we would certainly be back in touch with council. But a study isn't necessary, as Councillor Tanner suggested. I think it's it just not. Probably on the onset. Um, yeah. I, I guess it's, uh, I often say I like the term, we're committed, <laughs> if you play poker. <laughs> um, so I, I think at this point, we're, we're far enough down the road that uh, we've seen enough. Anyways, that's just me. Um, that uh, you're, at, you're at a point now that uh, the, the better investment would be to continue with the, the renovations if you want to see it um, be redeveloped as a whole. I'd like to turn. I'm pot committed too. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a motion to your I'm Sure, yes, please. Okay. I would move that counts for the town of Bridgewater use alternate procurement under section 18.1A of the procurement policy to award a remediation to the edict space to the former Bridgewater Memorial Arena to Paul Davis Restoration for a quoted sum of 79,257 HST, $87,400, including HST, and direct staff utilize remaining approved budget to complete the interior work resulting from remediation of to construct a fire rated separation wall between the transit parks facility and the gallery area of the former BMA with the project budget exceedance to be funded from reserves and direct staff to submit the remaining proposed project items to the 2023-24 budget deliberation process. <coughs> Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Caldwell. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good discussion. Good questions. Uh, Ten point three is uh, is notice amendments to grants to organizations policy temporary housing grant. Ms. Caldwell, I'd like to recu uh, recuse myself from this item. I have a family member who could from this item. Okay. Thank you. Always appreciate when member of council 
um, is prepared to step away for transparency. Um, yeah, so this is uh, this topic, as I mentioned in the uh, briefing session notes, this was um, brought forward by uh, one of our planning staff. Um, and so, as we are normally doing, we're giving uh, notice. I don't know if you had anything to add. No, nope, just it's just notice to consider a grant program that would look at funding for for temporary temporary or tiny shelters, whether temporary or permanent. And uh, the details of the grant program would be discussed at our next council meeting, November twenty eighth. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and this document is online, so I would encourage the public if they have any questions uh, or comments on this that they reach out to member of council, or, and if we don't have the answer, we can reach out to staff and get that. And again, in two weeks' time, this will be uh, on the agenda for us to. Um, to discuss yeah. more formally. Someone prepared to make a motion. Councilor Tanner. Member of the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater give notice pursuant to Section 48 of the Municipal Government Act that at the November 28, 2022 Council meeting, amendments to Policy 77 Grants Organizations will be considered to enable the provision of grants for tiny shelters with specific criteria. Thank you. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Fugier. Further discussion? None. All those in favor? Those opposed, motion is carried. Thank you. We will welcome back Councillor Caldwell. Uh, our next item is the 2023 South Shore Sustainability Summit. Yes. So this is a provides a bit more clarity with respect to a request that Council received a, a bit ago from um, an individual, Casey. Casey, the council. Well, I think it was not in the council. Uh, not in the council. Casey Dong. Council. Yes. And um, essentially what, what is being asked of the municipality is whether the municipality is interested in registering to participate in a climate summit. Um, what would be, District of Lunenburg would be the lead municipality and they've already indicated their commitment to that. Um, and then what, if the town were to participate, um, the cost would be $1,900 and what the town would receive for that is uh, the ability to participate in a workshop where uh, we would get together with the three or four other participating municipalities and you see the deliverables there are um, really about climate risk and opportunities for collaboration um, look at future partnerships that might be possible develop a work plan uh, create the agenda for a climate summit which would be a, a public event and then look at our remote policies and procedures. And then um, we would be able to participate in the climate summit. In fact, we'd be a presenter um, in, the in the summit where the municipal units would present what concerns and initiatives they have and are working on. And then lastly, a final work, uh, a, a partnership agreement workshop, which would be workshop number three, where we would work with the partner uh, municipalities to look at a draft par partnering agreement, uh, look at our asset management policies, there's a number of deliverables within that, and then a wrap-up workshop. So at this point, um, I am aware that the District of Lunenburg has made their commitment. The Town of Mahone Bay, I believe, is also participating. At the time I made the request, the District of Chester had not indicated that they were participating and the town of Lunenburg hadn't at the time either. And whether or not that's changed, I'm not too sure. But um, this is what's being asked of the municipality. And what we have is a, um, and they're, they're ready to move on this and they want to have a meeting as early as this week with staff to kind of work out the details. Okay. So do you need a motion from council? Or is this just no? Is this I a, would, no, I would just need operational? council to say that you wish to participate and register, knowing the fee is nineteen hundred dollars to do so, and then that that it's more than staff would be involved in this. Council would be involved. The councils would be involved in this as well. Right. So the the summit is for staff and council. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that was and my yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on that, Councillor Caldwell? So does staff have a recommendation regarding this? Um, we haven't discussed it at the at the management team. We know that this is something that's being proposed. Uh, we also know that our <coughs> our neighboring <coughs> municipality just recently came out with their climate mm -hmm. 
action plan, I believe it is. Yep. And there are a number of initiatives that do kind of rely on the town of Bridgewater, like transit and those types of things. So um, working with neighboring municipalities to look at where there may be opportunities to partner does, does make sense to do. I, whether or not we need this program to do that, I think that they're, they're offering to facilitate that and involve the community in that. So for, for $1,900, it's, you know, it's a fairly a good, good offering. I like the mix of <coughs> staff and council. Yeah, and the mix of that, and also yeah. you have an external body coming in to help facilitate those discussions. It w wasn't something that was on our radar screen as a priority, but we, we do know that you know it's going to be hard for one unit to move ahead with any initiative in isolation of the other. So, so yeah. is, is my math right that this is like a $100,000 they have funding through FCM to, to do this. So um, the organization, yeah. I, I didn't do the math on it, but I know that. Um, You're close. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, I, that, was, that was my question. The funding seemed, there seemed to be quite a bit of funding that I, my first thought was that it would, the result would be a free summit. <laughs> Because the funding was so high, I think there needs to um, be municipal contributions. But um, it's oh. it kind of reminded me of the <coughs> the MIT REAP, where yeah. even though there was a significant provincial and federal contribution, having part the difference between having participants have um, you know kind of skin in the game and those who didn't, the turnover for the ones that did not have to pay was well, there was turnover and there was no turnover on the the participants who did have to pay. So perhaps that's that's what they're looking at. I don't know. Yeah, I, I see it. you can use your gas tax fund, so really it's no direct cost to the town to doing that. We can, yeah. We can um, I see that yep, a or we could just use the yeah. Either I'm way. I'm just saying yeah. <laughs> it's gonna <laughs> be used. Use gas tax, it doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. <laughs> Is someone prepared to make a motion or do you have another question, Council Call? One more question. Yeah. Uh, it refers to the lead municipality. Yeah. Who's the lead? District of Olympia. Okay. They've they've already put put that forth that they would be the lead. Okay. Okay. What is council's wish? Council Call? Make a motion? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I move that council for the town of Bridgewater approve participation in the 2023 South Shore Sustainability Summit along with the associated expendi spending expenditure of $1,900. Thank you. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Fugier. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Those opposed? Mm. <laughs> Were you in favor? Or yes, opposed? I was in favor, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay, motion is carried. Um, did I miss the date? There's, there's not a date it set. It hasn't yet, been right? set yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, Next year, yeah. Well, well, we missed <laughs> we're meeting. Week. We're meeting um, Thursday to plan that. But stuff. I think when she was here, I think she said spring, right? She yeah, it's spring? in the spring of twenty. She did. Okay. I think there are dates in there for months. Right? Yeah, I yeah, saw that. Like close out August. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ends um, twenty three. Was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the partnering. Well, it's the Climate Summit yeah. public event, it says, is April. So yeah. I don't know, but they're running these in other areas of the country, too. Or other too. five yeah. in total, I think. Yeah, so maybe they're all supposed to be done in around April. Yeah. Just my first thought was, some people think spring, and then they immediately go to March break, mm -hmm. which is still in the winter. But um, that don't just don't do it in March, <laughs> March break, because you'll have low participation. It just says the program must be completed by November 2023. Okay. So we'll, we'll see. Okay. <coughs> Uh, moving on, we have our last um, last item before we have an in-camera meeting after, uh, and that is t for the community navigator position. Um, I'll turn it over to Patrick. All right, thank you. Uh, so the report uh, before council tonight is based on a request from council to consider the future and scope of the community navigator position uh, that we have in place this year as a pilot project. So just to refresh everyone's memory, in uh, late 2021, Council approved a pilot community navigator slash museum administrator position for the town. The position was initiated as a hybrid position with approximately 50% of the time going to community navigator duties, 
35% to museum administration and roughly 15% to Town of Bridgewater special events planning, which included Canada Day and music on the riverbank. The funding for that position uh, came from a combination of the Nova Scotia Community Works Program, which contributed roughly 50%. The existing museum administration staffing allocation and the existing town summer events staff funding, which is roughly $10,000. So the funding for the pilot program uh, runs through the end uh, of the current fiscal year, at which time the uh, pilot project community navigator and museum administrator position will be scheduled to end. So with an eye toward uh, the future of that position and specifically the community navigator role, um, over the past 10 months, uh, the staff member assigned to this position has worked on a wide range of community engagement and new resident-specific projects. Uh, the staff member has presented uh, two reports to Council in March and September uh, that specifically focused on community navigator activities to kind of loop Council in on the amount of uptake and interest and the engagement that, that position uh, has had with the community. The most recent report outlined in detail the volume of the community navigator specific tasks and requests that have been handled by the position during the first 10 months of the pilot project. Uh, some of the key uh, indicators coming out of that report included that nearly 200 new and prospective residents had been engaged since the role began. Uh, contacts of prospective residents have come not just from elsewhere in Nova Scotia or Canada, but around the world including Ukraine, Brazil, Mexico, Ireland, and India. The uh, pilot project uh, staff member has also had one-on-one -on -one engagement with just shy of 100 new residents who are already in Bridgewater and who contacted the community navigator through the Bridgewater uh, website's web portal, reached it by email, phone, or through uh, initial contact at Des Brise Museum. That's often the first point of contact for folks who settle in the community. The uh, staff member has worked closely with NSHA and members of town council on physician recruitment and community tours as well. They also participated in the NSHA's Rural Week program with uh, Dow Medical students. And they've uh, nurtured some close collaboration and uh, events and outreach uh, with uh, the South Shore Multicultural Association and our own uh, internal uh, event in September that was organized highly at the high level by community development but was focused on welcoming newcomers to the community. So the most recent Community Navigator report concluded uh, that strategies designed to attract residents and businesses are only part of the equation. And it's a part that we're doing very well right now, but that in order to get people to put down roots and invest financially, emotionally, and socially in Bridgewater, that a concerted and consistent effort to engage newcomers in our community and help them establish themselves is required. So with council acknowledging uh, the last report uh, that there was a significant impact uh, seen from the community <coughs> role in just a part-time capacity. Staff have prepared a detailed scope of work for what a full-time community navigator position would look like. And that uh, scope of work is attached to this report as Appendix A. I won't go through the details of that, but if you have any questions, we're certainly happy to answer them. So with all that having been said, staff have prepared a number of options for council to consider as it contemplates the future of the community navigator pilot position. Option number one, and this is the staff recommended option, is that council authorize pre-budget approval for the creation of a new full-time permanent community navigator position that would fall under the admin department and report to the communications manager. That would effectively separate out museum administrative duties and summer events coordination from that position. Those would be two separate things, so the role would focus solely on community navigator related activities. The estimated cost for that new position, including salary, benefits, and other ancillaries, is approximately $65,000. In this scenario, the museum would retain its existing allocation for museum administration and would use that to staff up accordingly. Also in this scenario, the existing allocation of $10,000 for the summer events coordinator would be used to hire a separate term employee as the town has historically traditionally done to coordinate summer events. Option two for council would be to separate the community navigator position only from museum administrative duties and essentially retain the summer events coordination portion of it as part of the community navigator role. The benefit to council is that instead of $65,000, we would essentially be taking the $10,000 that we allocate for a summer events coordinator each year and putting that towards the cost of the community navigator position. 
The downside and the concern that I think staff have in looking at this is that the summer events coordinator tends to ramp up its activities uh, in the spring and through the summer. Um, that's ideally a time where a community navigator that was solely focused on that position would also be looking at doing, organizing, and uh, executing community events that are designed to integrate newcomers, connect them with existing residents, and really build up that sense of community. So from that perspective, staff aren't sure that the two, while they run parallel with each other, they're not necessarily compatible because of the demands placed on the summer events coordinator. Option three for council would be to approve the change from pilot project to full-time permanent status of the current museum administrator slash community navigator position. So essentially option three is to carry on what we have in place now. Now, there is also pre-budget approval required there because um, the original, the current project that we have, the current position, is partially funded by Nova Scotia Community Works to the tune of about $25,000. So if council wishes to continue as we are now, which is 50% community navigator, 35% museum administrator, and 15% events coordinator, council would still have to authorize a pre-budget expenditure of $25,000 to offset what we had previously received from Nova Scotia uh, Community Works. The fourth option for council, uh, which you may choose, is to simply let the community navigator pilot project expire at the end of the current contract, which is March 31st, 2023. And the fifth option, of course, is that council could request more information or <laughs> choose your own adventure and uh, give different direction entirely. So with all that having been said, staff are looking for direction from council tonight in terms of how it wishes to proceed with the community navigator pilot program going forward. Thank you, Councilor Caldwell. If we choose uh, option one, for example, yeah. what would happen to the 35% that is now going dedicated to the museum? So that um, is already in the museum's budget, as you know, and it would be reallocated among existing part-time staff there to provide the museum administrative support that's required. Okay, so in, in reality, on the ground, nothing changes at the museum. That's Just correct. Somebody else is filling those up. <coughs> that's correct. Okay. And um, my second question was how uh, common or unusual is it to have this position in a uh, municipality of our size? Um, off the top of my head, I can't recall how many others are in service in Nova Scotia. I believe there may be one in the northern half of the province. Um, it would certainly be um, somewhat unique, yes. Okay. Yeah, cutting edge, if you will. Other questions? I know just, just uh, I speak for uh, Councillor Tanner and Deputy Mayor Fougere, um, that this position is, is in the, when we get an email that there's a physician coming and needing a tour, um, it, it is usually, okay, which one of the three of us can, um, or it could be any one of the seven of us really, who can give this physician the tour. Um, the, I mean, we can just face it. Cheryl gives the best tour, but um, the the issue becomes that you now have three different tours or seven different styles of tours. There's no person anchoring that position, and so um, when we originally talked about the community navigator position, having one person as that point of contact, it just it becomes consistent, and they can follow up, um, build that relationship with our physician recruiter, because. Um, like I said, we've we've each given at least a half dozen tours, I think, over the last couple of years, um, but that's three different people. So I think I think that consistency um, would uh, lead to a. I mean, we've had some big successes with with physician recruitment, um, but we're getting more tours. But I think it would it would lead to more success if it was one point person that could work with. In this case, uh, Patty at Health, um, and that's just for physician recruitment. Then you're, you've got all the other newcomers. So, anyway, that's all, that's my long-winded way of saying, um, maybe cutting edge, but I, I think you're, we're going to be shocked if we don't see this happening in other municipalities, as the province has committed to doubling the population. Um, I don't know how you try to attract and retain all those people. Um, without someone who can consistently provide them all the information and, and, and data that they need. 
I think that's my my thoughts, Councillor Thorber. No, I, I agree with you. I, we used to have at one time what we used to call the welcome wagon. <laughs> somebody moved to town, somebody would look at it, but I don't think since I've been on council that it's ever been activated. I see it listed somewhere, but I, I never uh, see much going on. And I think we missed we missed a big opportunity, and with the hundred people that was interviewed this year and the information that this one person can provide, I, I think we'd be ill-advised not to have leading edge technology and the ability to interact with new residents and existing residents to provide information to make them better feel part of the community. So that's why I think this is important and I would support this motion. I highly believe in this vision and this role and I'll be happy to make the motion if you'd like. If perfect. <laughs> I move that Council for the Town of Bridgewater authorize the pre-budget approval for the community navigator position to become a new full-time position in the town's administrative uh, administration department, effective April 1, 2023, as presented in document 22-189. Wonderful. Seconded by Councilor <laughs> Thorman. He was, he was just like was waiting. <laughs> he was waiting. <laughs> Further discussion? Question. Question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, we have reached the end of our meeting. We have an in-camera meeting um, to discuss uh, contract negotiations under the Section 22.2e of the Municipal Government Act. I, we didn't really talk about the NSFM at the beginning of the, of the meeting. So um, there were four, four of us that went to the NSFM. Mm -hmm. It was the first time we've had an in-person NSFM conference in a few years. Mm -hmm. Turnout was, was pretty good. I know mm -hmm. that, that it's hard to kind of get back in the swing of things. Um, I was I was thrilled that four of us went and we kind of all split off and went to, I keep holding your microphone. <laughs> um, I talk with my hands too much today. Uh, we split off and went to different sessions. There were some really good sessions, uh, good networking sessions. I met with the regional urbans. We're gonna meet again uh, either the end of this month or early next month because we have some homework that we've assigned ourselves and so that will be interesting so um, Mayor Savage has agreed to host us for the next one, so that'll be good. Um, I thought it was the yeah. best NSFM conference that I've ever been at, honestly. It was, I thought the sessions were really top-notch. Was forward. there a particular takeaway? Well, the, the Premier uh, <laughs> being there and promising a few things was probably <laughs> the biggest takeaway, thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, well, I don't want to take all the credit, but okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I, no, but you're, you're uh, yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a meeting with the Premier, and I, uh, be full disclosure, I didn't raise Bridgewater-specific issues. I know um, somebody, <laughs> somebody wondered what Bridgewater got. It was nothing that I talked about was specific for Bridgewater. But he did the next day say that, um, and I had heard from the deputy minister that they had already put some of those items into action. Um, so that was that was a big, a big win, and um, the inclusion session. The inclusion I session was, was good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything. I like the opportunity when uh, we were able to go to the round tables and um, the Nova Scotia. Uh, departments were, d I don't know, it might have been 20 tables or plus where we could pick our table. Um, so you, I think first off we went to economic mm -hmm. development and then we went to housing, but you could ask any question to staff one on one, like, and it was nice to sort of have your colleagues from other towns, um, you know, bounce ideas off and have the same issues or common theme so it was good to um, ask staff and what they're what they're doing especially the housing crisis that we're in so it was it was good to hear from them yeah it was a good conference and yeah. uh, congratulations to mayor carolyn bolivar getson who is now the vice yeah. president of the organization yeah. and to mayor mm -hmm. brenda chisholm beaton who is the president of the nsfm mm -hmm. um, and yeah. also a member of the regional urban so um, happy for them both all right, can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Councillor mm -hmm. Thorburn, seconded by Councillor Tanner. We are adjourned.